Good morning and welcome to To The Point. The elections of Decision 2014 have now been over for more than 30 days. We know the outcome of almost all of those races. What we don't know, however, is exactly who voted or why they voted the way they did. That's part of our conversation this morning with the chairman of the Michigan Democratic Party. Lon Johnson, in his first major election, had high hopes for Democratic turnout. In the end, it would appear that didn't materialize, but as he tells us this morning, he's still trying to figure out exactly what happened in Decision 2014. I want to go back to about a month ago. I had been following the Democratic candidate for governor the weekend before the election, mm -hmm. and I couldn't help but think about what you had told me more than a year earlier. What your plan was to identify Democrats who hadn't voted two years or four years earlier, but had voted two years earlier, and again, six years prior to that, how you were going to identify them, not just find out who they were, but make contact with them. And I was at two events, one over uh, on Wealthy Street and another one over the third congressional district headquarters. And as an observer, I had to stand back and say, this Lon Johnson got this thing figured out. You had people enthused, you had people that were out knocking doors, you had people who were saying, look, we can do this thing. And it came down to a very narrow margin, within the margin of error, very near to what our last poll said. It goes without saying, I, I suspect, that as the chairman of the party, you're disappointed with the outcome because obviously you had other dogs in the hunt. But talk to me about the process and where you think it worked and where you think it might work better. Well, we're still waiting for the final. Um, the Secretary of State won't release who voted uh, until later, uh, mid-month, mid-December. Mid um, so we, we don't know just yet um, what occurred on this election day. We lost. We know that. Um, but when, you know, looking back, our strategy had always been to identify those Democrats that did not vote normally in midterm elections, identify them, message them, and make sure they turn out. Now, um, you know, to do that, we, we, we put together, and, and again, we take no solace in what I'm about to tell you in the sense that we're proud of what we did, but it didn't work. Um, we, we opened up 43 offices, we had over 120 staff, we sent out over a million absentee applications, all aimed at those voters. Now what we saw going into that election, you know, we figured we had about, we had to turn out about 200,000 of those ID Democrats that did not vote in 2010. Well, we know uh, 103,000 of them applied to vote by absentee. And so the goal was from there um, was to get them to turn out on election day. And clearly that didn't, you know, we don't know, we, clearly we don't think that that, that occurred. Um, we, we do take some great amount of pride um, in electing the only new Democratic senator, U.S. Senator Gary Peters. We do take a great amount of pride. We, we won seven of the eight Ed Board elections. Um, we do take a, a great amount of pride in the fact that more Democra uh, Democrats receive more votes in the State House than Republicans statewide. Same with the Congressionals. So, you know, something happened out there. We don't know just yet what. We do know this is not to shy away. We lost. And we have to take a deep, hard look and look in the mirror and figure out what did not work and, and improve for next year. But we did, um, I believe, move the needle um, on, on turnout with some constituencies, but not others. Let's talk a little bit, starting with the governor's race. Um, the governor, and, and I will give you a couple of observations from somebody who has watched these things for a while. Clearly, you're uh, a big student in politics. When this started, you have an incumbent Republican governor. He has majorities in the House and in the Senate. That gives him an added advantage going into a general election. Absolutely. Both the Democrats and Republicans avoided primaries, both in yes. the governor's race and the U.S. Senate race. But it still looked to me like it was Governor Snyder's to lose, just historically, numerically, looking at the polls, et cetera, et cetera. Mark Schauer, no stranger to tough campaigns, uh, I, I think by all accounts uh, put on a heck of a campaign uh, in pretty long odds and brought this thing very, very close. So given all of that, were you surprised or did you think it was about on par that this thing closed at the end the way it did? Yeah. you know. We knew that, you know, going into that, those last two, three weeks, you know, we were our internal polling, uh, other allies polling, um, and, uh, was showing a race within the margins. Then we were buoyed by the fact that um, external polling started showing the same thing. That coupled with our internal reports of showing who was turning out 
via the absentee program gave us a shot in the arm um, that we felt that we, we were going into election day um, with what could be a victory. Um, when, you know, let's remember, you know, looking back now, we now know was a Republican way. We kept an incumbent Republican governor who had financial advantages and all the incumbency advantages um, to less than 51 percent of the vote. Um, we can take pride in that fact. Um, it, it, we didn't win, and we've got to figure out why. Um, but going into Election Day, if, I think if you would ask all, you know, all major reporters that I talked to and other observers, they didn't know what was going to happen on Election Day. And you know, going from where we started to that uh, in itself was a victory, um, but obviously it, it wasn't a victory Election Day, um, which is what, what all the marbles were for. When you look at the outcome of this election, You've said it a couple of times, look, we didn't win, and that, that was what your goal was. But you know that you accomplished two of those three things that you set out, that you told me more than a year ago that you wanted, um, probably a year and a half ago, identifying the voters and contacting the voters. So with those two things accomplished, making the assumption, as you say, we don't know, because we, we haven't who seen turned who out. turned out, but we know that not enough of the people that you contacted apparently turned out, is that and I know it's early on, people say, well, it's been a month, but it takes a while to dissect these things. Is that a matter of messaging or messenger, or will you ever know? Well, again, that's, we don't know yet. We will, we, we will make some educated guesses, but we'll only be able to come to that once we know who voted. You know, get out the vote is a, a product of two things. One is the message and the motivation side of things. The other one is the mechanics, the door knock, the phone call, the absentee application, the reminding them it's election day. And, and all that part, you must feel relatively confident we you got We feel very to, confident yeah. that we executed on that. You know, we knocked over two million doors. We had over 43 offices. We made over two million phone calls. We sent out over a million absentee applications. You know, as far as the mechanics of the execution, I believe it was executed, and it was executed <clears throat> rather flawlessly. The question is, was that enough? What is it that motivates you in a circumstance like this? You, you came in, even when you walked in here today, it was the same uh, high-spirited, uh, energetic look at what you're doing. This is a, in many ways, a thankless job being the head of a, a, a state party <laughs> because you've got uh, hours and hours of seat time, you've got dozens and dozens of meetings, all of these things you talked about so gleefully during this process. When you wake up the day after the election, there's going to be a little letdown because obviously you have a lot of emotion invested in this, but now with a, the advantage of a little time left behind, what is your view going forward? What is it that Lon Johnson wants to do with the Michigan Democratic Party? Well, look what sustains me and what sustains many in, in politics and our party. What we do matters. You know, um, elections matter, and who we put in office matters. And, you know, that's what sustains, you know, me on a personal level day after day. Um, the work that we do matters. We need to build a state where everyone can succeed, where we can stay and succeed here in Michigan. And we believe we do that by creating and putting people in office who will invest in and protect our greatest assets, our people, our land, our Great Lakes. And that's what sustains uh, not only me, but many office holders and our party. Um, you know, I think this is, um, you know, politics is, elections tell you who's in power, not who holds the truth. When you look at what happened in Michigan, there was something unique. There were only a handful of places that could say in the final closing weeks that the First Lady of the United States, former First Lady, former Senator, former Secretary of State, and, and likely presidential candidate, Clinton, uh, former Lady, President, President Obama, of the United Clinton. States, and yep. President Obama all came in. Yes. Give me your take on what that did or didn't do. Obviously, that's got to be good for the core, for the base uh, to motivate. And you, you always said, you're very upfront, that you would welcome President Obama into this state anytime he wanted to come and you were one of the few states that really did see him get out and, and campaign uh, the way he did here. Uh, net plus, net minus, or will you ever know? Net plus, you know, what you have to understand the responsibilities of the party versus the responsibilities of a candidate. The responsibilities of a party is to motivate the core Democratic, you know, the core Democratic voters and turn them out. The, that's the responsibility of the party. And to those ends, that's what we did. You know, we set up offices, we messaged those voters. Um, and we brought in, you know, uh, uh, national leaders to motivate those audiences. 
and you know, to those ends, we, we felt that we, we executed. Now, whether or not that was enough, we don't know until we see Election Day. Obviously, we, it wasn't enough to win, um, but we have to understand, you know, what, what people need to understand is the role of a party is to turn out its base electorate. And to those ends, that's what we set about doing. And, and bringing those national leaders in were, were, was consistent with that, with, that, uh, with that strategy. You and I have talked politics off camera, and I won't discuss that because that was off camera. But in the past, both Republicans and Democrats have been reticent to bring in presidents or other high-profile figures into races. And after the fact, wondered, maybe we should have done that. And I don't want you to throw any of your other state party chairmen uh, under the bus, but or any of the other candidates. But there were some states where it was pretty clear that they weren't extraordinarily excited to have President Obama come in. Given the outcome, particularly of the U.S. Senate races, do you think the president might have been of some help in some states where he, I don't want to say he wasn't invited, but where he wasn't featured in some of those campaigns? Well, I can just say here in Michigan, you know, the way you conduct a midterm election. Um, is one of two ways. You can go to those voters you know are going to turn out and seek to persuade them, and that's largely a, a more conservative, older audience. Or the other path is um, to find voters you know who support you but who don't necessarily turn out in a midterm election and seek to, to drive them to the polls. That's the strategy the party took. And to do that, we needed all the tools we could, we could muster. And part of, you know, again, that was the door knocks, that was the messaging, and that was the national audience. Now, I can't speak for any other, any other chairs, but Michigan is an overwhelmingly democratic state. You know, I will say that Gary Peters did not run from this president uh, at, at any moment um, and um, stood by the president, and he won overwhelmingly. Now, I can't speak for other Senate races or other states, but that was a, that was a very conscious decision by the party very early on that we would seek to bring those, those individuals in and, and, and it was not in any way, sh you know, it was encouraged by both Gary Peters and Mark Schauer. There is much more to talk about, not just the fallout from Decision 2014, but what's next for Lon Johnson and the Michigan Democratic Party. That's next, To The Point. Welcome back to To The Point. A few weeks ago, we had the chairman of the Republican Party, Bobby Shostak, on our program. He talked about Decision 2014 and how he and others were really uncertain as how that race might turn out right up until election night. Same is true for Lon Johnson and the Michigan Democratic Party. The difference is the Democrats did not prevail in as many races as they would have liked to. So what's next for the Michigan Democratic Party? We continue our discussion. Let's talk about where we are today. As you and I talk, members in the House and the Senate in Michigan are still meeting and, and discussing uh, I suspect by the time this airs, there's not going to be a conclusion about anything to do with significant issues like Rhodes or Elliot Larson or any of those things, at least not the, the, the final episode. But given what's going on there, what do you do next? You go back into the state Senate uh, with a minority. There's a recount going on. We don't know exactly how that will turn out. Same thing over uh, in the House. Republicans still largely in charge. And I know it's not the party's job to go cast votes. That's the member's job. But at the same time, there is a message, no doubt, that you would like or there are issues that uh, you would like to, to, to see push forward. How do you deal with that over the next two years going into a very important presidential election cycle uh, working from a minority standpoint? Well, we're going to work with Jim Ananek, the, our next our incoming Senate president or Senate leader, and uh, Tim Grimel, the incoming uh, House Democratic leader, to work with them to develop their, um, their legislative goals for this year, and then we will seek to see how we could assist that politically, um, you know, in terms of helping them drive the message, helping them um, uh, craft that legislation to move it forward in their, in their respective houses. Um, you know, at the party, what we're going to be doing is understanding what did and did not work in 2014 and seek to, uh, to, to, seek to improve upon that. Um, this you know, there will be, we will be presented with a number of challenges that we did not have last year legislatively. Um, but also, I think the Republican leadership will as well. You know, that when you look at this incoming class of Republicans, both in the House and the Senate, they're more conservative. And I think they, there will be more moments of, of bipartisanship um, than there was even than previous years. Um, I think this governor is going to need Democratic votes to get things uh, uh, done, and I think that's where Jim Ananick and Tim Grimel um, will have some moments of, of leadership. 
Uh, tell me about those two leaders, because I, I know them both, uh, obviously, uh, Leader Grimal from uh, the, his past leadership role, uh, and Senator Ananik, uh, his relatively new arrival over in the Senate and uh, assuming that role. Uh, they, they both appear to have, obviously, they, they have their own ideas and, and they have their own set of values, but they both seem to be willing uh, to make that kind of reach across the aisle because mm -hmm. Democrats just recently uh, helped Republicans in the Senate come up with a solution on roads. Uh, for, on roads. Mm -hmm. um, I think there were six, if I'm not mistaken, um, that, that voted in favor of that. Uh, is, is that the kind of approach you think that we're going to see over the next two years? You know, I can't speak for Tim or for Jim, Tim Grimal or for Jim Ananik, but I can tell you that both of them want to see a Lansing that works, that gets things done for people. And, you know, uh, contrary to what we see uh, out of some of the, you know, some of the, the Republican Tea Party um, uh, new members and existing members who come in and want to just be obstructionist. You know, both, uh, both the leaders in the Demo of, of the Democratic Party in the House and the Senate um, share a common philosophy of wanting to get things done. People are tired of what they see out of Lansing and Washington. Um, they want leaders who are going to go on a bipartisan basis and get things done for the people of Michigan. And I think that's part of the success why we saw Gary Peters. He had a demonstrated, uh, demonstrated track record of doing that in Washington um, as a member of Congress, and they chose that for the Senate. And I think, again, what, they, what the people of Michigan want are leaders to get things done, and they're done with the partisan bickering. What do you see, and, and again, this is just you and your crystal ball, because uh, I suspect you and Rick Snyder haven't sat down and had long conversations about <laughs> policy, but uh, given his propensity, um, to be a little bit surprising. On, on one hand, uh, he did a lot of things that you, your party, and, and uh, candidate Shower uh, talked about as being what you thought were very negative uh, during his first four years. On the other hand, uh, he did some things that I suspect, not putting words in your mouth, that you agreed with, the expansion of Medicaid, uh, when he was pretty forceful mm -hmm. pushing that through against the wishes of many in his party, uh, even now working on roads, doing something that is probably not exactly the way many in his party would like to do it, but yet trying to uh, to come up with that extra money. Do you see this governor being more, I asked you the, a moment ago, if you saw your leadership being uh, more willing to work uh, across the aisle, do you see this governor in his final term where he doesn't have to stand for election, again, for governor, being more willing to reach out to Democrats? You know, he, he counts votes just like everybody else. And, you know, where he may not be able to get those votes, Again, I don't speak for the governor, clearly. <laughs> um, but he counts votes in the House and the Senate just like everybody else. And I think that he may see opportunities to work alongside the Democrats where his own party would be reticent. Um, and you know, to the degree that Tim and, uh, and Jim, Jim Anik and Tim Grimal, see that this is an opportunity to work together to get things done, I'm sure they'll have an open year. 56 and 19 adds up the same way no matter if you're a there Republican you or a Democrat. Correct. Let's talk about nationally. Obviously, Republicans now find themselves in a unique position. They control the House as they have for some time, but now the U.S. Senate. But at the same time, the president still has a veto pen. Yes. What is, and again, this is a, a little bit of just your observational skills, but um, President Obama is not President Clinton. President Clinton pivoted pretty quickly and, and worked with uh, Republican members and, and came up with some, what I, again, as an observer, I would say is some pretty bipartisan. significant uh, bipartisan legislation. Mm -hmm. You see that happening in this cycle? I don't know. You know, again, this is a class of, of some of these folks, both the existing Tea Party, um, the extremists that are there, and with the incoming class, they've made a, they made a, they got elected fighting this president, not on a working, you know, uh, not on getting elected on a, on, on a, on a platform of, of getting things done on a bipartisan basis, it was more of a combative nature. Um, you know, so you know, I think time will tell. But this, um, you know, I think the Republicans are, need to be very cautious. Um, they've been burned a number of times with shutting down the government, um, and I think they, you know, the map is going to be very different t for 2016 for the Senate. Um, and I think they need to be careful, and I think that uh, I would hope that they would work on a more bipartisan basis with this, base, with this president. Does the president bear any responsibility in that? He has been, uh, in, in some cases, Republicans would say, I go it alone when it comes to the Affordable Care Act. They could find no compromise. Just recently, he made his own decisions on immigration. Does the president have a role to play in reaching out as well? Well, he has, you know, again, not to, to add to this partisan fire, but he has. He's, you know, we've, 
the, how, the, the U.S. Senate passed a bipartisan immigration bill. It has sat lingering for over 500 days in the House of Representatives. This country can't wait for solutions. This cannot, country can no longer afford to be bogged down in partisan bickering. And so what this president did was move forward. And that's, you know, that's I, th I hope, um, a, a lesson to the Republicans in, in Washington, that we can either work together or we will move forward. And um, you know, I, I think, I, I would hope that this incoming class and the leadership in, in Washington would realize that the American people are done with partisan bickering and we want action. We need to move this country forward. And that's what this president did. On one hand, uh, this election cycle is not what you hoped for. Your first major election cycle as chairman of the Michigan Democratic Party. On the other hand, the good news is that the next election cycle is a presidential election year, and Democrats haven't lost a presidential general election race in this state since 1988. So uh, at least the numbers are with you uh, historically. What do you do to gear up for that? I mean, obviously, you already pointed out you're going to look at some of the data and you're going to try to figure out what you can you know, build on. And, and, but, but just in general, how do you start gearing up when it's not exactly clear who your candidates are going to be. It seems right now that there may be some front runners, but we know that can change too. And Michigan will be ground zero for a lot of that activity if the past serves as any prediction. Sure. Well, you know, we, we continue on the, in the capacity building of the party. You know, while we lost um, this cycle, uh, many of our races that we wanted to win, we built a stronger membership. We took our email list from 100,000 to 500,000. We increased our capacity. We, we, we had 21,000 volunteers. We had 43 officers. We're going to continue on that trajectory and only get bigger and draft behind what you just said, a larger turnout and a, a better political environment for Democrats in a statewide uh, election uh, that is being a presidential year. So we will seek to draft behind that and see what kind of wins we can do that and see if we can pick up uh, seats in the House and the Senate and more, uh, more to the point also at the county levels in, in, in uh, Ingham and uh, in Kent and uh, uh, Grand Traverse and Oakland. When you look at the total picture, the, the, the election cycle, some really great promise, some good turnout, as you point out, a lot of races you would like to have won where you came close. What is the attitude of the rank and file member? Because there were a lot of people that were really excited. There were a lot of people who really believed. I talked to people who I've known for a couple of decades who said, Rick, we can win this thing, and this yeah. is, this is going to happen. There was a lot of enthusiasm out there with that after an election sometimes comes a little letdown. But what's the general feel from your perspective? Well, disappointed. Absolutely disappointed, you know, a bit bewildered. How did this happen? Um, you know, again, how, you know, our polling, I think the Republican polling showed that, public polling showed that, um, and all of a sudden, you know, to lose uh, by four points in the governor's race was, you know, it's a, it's a big letdown. But it's also the same thing that we just started with this interview. What we do matters. We, we cannot afford to give up. Um, we're resigned to the fact that you know, we lost this election, but we're also resigned to the fact what we do matters and we have to pick ourselves up and move forward. Our thanks to Chairman Johnson for coming in and talking to us this week about Decision 2014. And as he pointed out, there are still many things about the election that we don't know, but in the weeks to come, we will continue to examine exactly what happened and try to figure out what that might mean for Decision 2016 that's already underway. We're back with more To The Point in just a moment. So decision 2014 is in the books, but exactly what it means and the impact of those races will be felt for years to come. We, of course, will move on. We'll continue to follow the lame duck session of the Michigan legislature, where they're still trying to figure out what, if anything, to do about road funding. And of course, the big inauguration for the second term of Governor Rick Snyder coming up in just a few weeks. We hope you'll join us right here for all of that and more each Sunday morning at 10 for To The Point.